Our scripture reading comes from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, By no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At the very moment, three men went to me from Caesarea, arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the words of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Let us pray. Come upon us, O God, in power and in might, with the love and peace of your Holy Spirit. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be acceptable in your sight. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You got a nice white dress and a party on your confirmation. <laughs> At the first service, with our eighth graders, I held up a crisp $5 bill and asked if anybody could name the writer of that song. <laughs> and I kept my money. Now, it may be a different style of music than what we've been hearing so far in this service, but Old People of Knox, who wrote that song? Billy Joel. Billy Joel. Thank you very much. There was a time when confirmation was a common enough subject to include it in a top 40 song. But those days are gone. Fewer teenagers are getting confirmed because their parents say that they have to. And they are not alone. The whole culture is wondering if going to church matters. Far fewer people are going to church now than in the 90s when I was confirmed, and even fewer than in 78 when that song was written. And that might not be a bad thing. Getting confirmed because your parents say you have to is unlikely to keep a person coming back to church. 
But some of us have made our own choice to be here, and we have a different story to tell. I loved confirmation, and I got really involved in my youth group, and not just because I'm the kind of church nerd who grows up and becomes a pastor. I tell you, as I told the eighth graders in our first service today, that I loved youth group because as a teenager, it was a safe place for me. At church, people weren't as mean and unforgiving as I found them to be elsewhere. Church did not involve a lot of the fitting in that I felt pressure to do so at school. And over time, church became the place where I most felt I could be myself. As time went on, I started to see these things about church more broadly. In a world where people are increasingly uncivil and divisive and even cruel to one another, in a world where you wake up to find the latest news of the war atrocities in Ukraine and racial violence in Buffalo, Christians are people who are called to be kind and decent and loving in their own personal lives and hopeful for justice and active out in the world. When we do that, we are doing something rare and important in the world, something that can change our communities when we both live it here and take it beyond the walls of the church. These values are important whether you are in eighth grade or you are 38 or you are 88. So I told our confirmands three things this morning, and they are equally important for our new members in this worship service to hear. One, joining the church is not what it used to be. Confirmation is no longer what everybody does with a white dress for girls and a carnation in your lapel for boys, a party where your dad invites his client and your mom invites her bridge club, no. There is no longer any social expectation that you will do this. It is your choice. And so don't do it for anyone else. The second thing I told our confirmands is I praised them for their profession of faith. We ask our confirmands, as they are learning the Christian faith, to engage in an exercise of writing together their own corporate confession of what they believe about the Christian faith. Let me read you some excerpts from what they wrote. We believe in a God who loves everyone. We believe God sets a pathway for us to follow, to be the best people of God that we can be. God desires for us to live together in community. That community has a purpose. I have a purpose. It is our responsibility to engage in God's plan by spreading faith, love, positivity, and help to those in need. Faith is a mystery too big and too great to to understand, and yet still we believe. Magnificent. And I was especially struck that almost 30 years later, our confirmands made in their statement one of the same things I would have said at my own confirmation, quote, our church should be a safe place for all of God's people. This is what church is supposed to be. But as I said to our eighth graders, so I say to all of you, you must make it so. You have to be a part of your church in order for these things to be a part of your life. You cannot observe them from a distance and expect all of this to be true for you. And so the third point, I said to them, I hope you will find, as I have, that church can be one of the best things that you ever do for the world and for yourself. It can be a source of freedom from all the things in life that seem most depressing and anxious and fearful and unfair, and I pray that you will choose this for yourself. At this worship service, another group of new members join us. 
They are older than the confirmands, but they ask their own questions about a church commitment that is no longer socially required. Perhaps they are wondering things like this. Will I make connections with good people here? Will they welcome me? Perhaps they're wondering if this is a good place to teach children, children the faith. These are mature people, so they probably understand that this community is not perfect, but they may be wondering if we are authentic about ourselves. Can we come here with our flaws, or do we walk in on Sunday trying to look all buttoned up and perfect? Are we judgmental, or do we exhibit grace? These are the kinds of questions our new members might be asking, and they will be answered not by a sermon, but by the relationships they form here. So let me speak for a moment to the rest of you who have been at Knox for a while. Many of you have been here at Knox and continue to be here because one day, some time ago, a member of this church reached out to you in friendship. When we hold funerals, we hear their stories. Craig Richmond helped me when my father passed away. Gene Crandall was the one who invited me to join the choir. Jack Platner gave me advice on how to pray. We tell these stories often. What does not always get said is this, if you are one generation younger than the saints I just mentioned, it is your turn. It is your turn. No one told Craig and Jean and Jack that it was their role to reach out in friendship to people in our church. They just did it. They brought no particular training or qualification. They reached out to newer people because they loved this place and they wanted others to share in what they had found here. Now it's your turn. This morning's scripture was from the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the earliest collection of stories about what happened in the church right after the life of Jesus. Mostly, Acts is a collection of stories about the ways they messed up. They were human beings trying to follow Jesus, and they were trying to do so without him right in front of them for the first time. The Apostle Peter, in the passage we read this morning, is trying to figure out something. Do you have to have been Jewish, like Jesus was, in order to be one of his followers, or can you come from a different background? Verse 2 sets that context. Peter's friends criticize him, asking, why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Peter is trying to figure this out. In verse 12, Peter gives them his tentative answer. The Spirit told me to go with them and to, make, to not make a distinction between them and us. This is where the Spirit is leading him. And by the end of the story, Peter's friends, his listeners, are getting it. In verse 18, it says, When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, then God has given to the Gentiles the good news of Jesus Christ. Church. Church is about everyone finding a welcome as a child of God, regardless of their background or history, the doubts or the questions that they bring, when or how they find their way here. It is about young people like our confirmands getting a break from the nasty relationships that are so often a part of our teenage years. It's about new people showing up and making a friend because someone else reaches out to them. And it's about the established set of longtime members owning their precious responsibility to welcome others into the family of God. There is nothing profound or original about today's sermon. What I say makes a very little difference today. As I said to our confirmands, so I say to you, I have no clue what the preacher said the day I was confirmed. What I do know is this. 
the kind of relationships I have enjoyed in church, that is what has kept me here. So in the time between now and the blessing at the end of the service, perhaps you will wish to ask yourself what you will do today and in the days to come to welcome one of the new people who has decided to join us. How will you remind them of their value and importance here and make sure they come back soon and often knowing that they, like you, are a beloved child of God?